Anatomy of Scalp. Let's begin our discussion with a simple, clear idea. The scalp. The scalp is essentially a five-layered soft tissue cap that covers the upper part of the skull, or the neurocranium. An important concept students must remember is that the first three layers of the scalp behave like a single functional unit. These layers move together as one sheet, and this combined structure is known as the scalp proper. Now let's walk through the five layers of the scalp using the classic mnemonic S-C-A-L-P. We begin with skin. This is a thick, hair-bearing layer packed with sebaceous and sweat glands. Because of this richness, conditions like folliculitis and seborrhea are common here. The skin is also very well vascularized, which means wounds heal quickly, but they also bleed quite heavily. Beneath the skin lies the dense connective tissue layer. This is a fibro-fatty, highly vascular, and highly innervated layer. Its fibrous scepter act like tiny splints that hold blood vessels open. So when the scalp is cut, these vessels cannot retract, leading to profuse, persistent bleeding. A very important clinical point. The third layer is the aponeurosis, also called the Galea aponeurotica. This broad, tendinous sheet stretches across the skull, connecting the frontalis muscle in front to the occipitalis at the back and blends laterally with the temporoparietal fascia. If this layer is lacerated, the opposing pull of these muscles causes the wound edges to gape widely. Deep to this lies the loose areola tissue, often described as the dangerous layer of the scalp. This layer forms a sliding plane allowing the scalp proper, the first three layers, to glide freely over the skull. But clinically, it's dangerous because blood and pus can spread easily through this space, and emissary veins here communicate directly with the dural venous sinuses. This means infections can track inward and potentially cause intracranial complications like sinus thrombosis, including cavernous sinus thrombosis. This layer is also the surgical cleavage plane used when raising scalp flaps. Finally, we reach the pericranium, which is simply the periosteum covering the skull bones. It's firmly attached along the sutures, so any collection beneath the pericranium like a cephalohematoma, remains limited by suture lines. This is in sharp contrast to subaponeurotic collections, which can cross sutures because the loose areola tissue above is not restricted. Now that we understand the layers of the scalp, let's look at some very important clinical correlations that help you connect anatomy with real-life scenarios. First, why do scalp wounds bleed so heavily? The answer lies in the dense connective tissue layer, where arteries are tightly anchored by fibrous septa. Because they're tethered, these vessels cannot retract when cut, so bleeding is brisk and persistent. Next, why do scalp wounds gape open? This happens when a cut involves the gallia aponeurotica. The frontalis muscle pulls upward, the occipitalis pulls backward, and together they drag the wound edges apart. Another interesting clinical observation is the classic black eye after a forehead injury. When the forehead is struck, blood collects in the loose areola tissue, the dangerous layer. Since the frontalis muscle inserts into the skin, not the bone, the blood can freely track downward and settle into the eyelids. This leads to periorbital ecchymosis, even when the injury was far above the eye. Speaking of the dangerous layer, it also explains 
how infections can spread intracranially. Pus or infected material in this plane can travel through emissary veins, which directly connect the scalp to the dural venous sinuses. This can lead to serious complications like septic sinus thrombosis. Finally, let's differentiate two important types of hematomas. A subperiosteal hematoma, also called a cephalohematoma, lies deep to the pericranium. Because the pericranium is firmly attached at sutures, these collections never cross suture lines. In contrast, a subaponeurotic bleed occurs in the loose areola layer. Since this plane is unrestricted, the blood can cross sutures and spread widely across the scalp. This distinction becomes especially important in newborns and trauma cases. Let's now look at the vascular supply of the scalp, an area famous for its rich circulation and brisk bleeding. The arterial supply comes from both the internal and external carotid systems. From the internal carotid system, we have the supratrochlea and supraorbital arteries. From the external carotid system, the major contributors are the superficial temporal, occipital, and posterior auricular arteries. These arteries form extensive anastomoses, not only across the midline, but also between the internal and external carotid systems. This explains two important clinical features, rapid, heavy bleeding when the scalp is injured, and at the same time, excellent collateral circulation, which supports good healing. Now let's talk about venous drainage. The veins of the scalp closely accompany their corresponding arteries, draining into superficial venous networks. However, the key clinical point is that these veins also connect with emissary veins, which pass through the skull and communicate directly with the intracranial dural venous sinuses. This creates a potential pathway for infection to spread from the scalp into the cranium, making venous anatomy just as important as the arterial supply. Let's now explore how the scalp is supplied by nerves and how its lymph drains. We'll begin with innervation. The scalp receives sensation from branches of all three divisions of the trigeminal nerve, as well as cervical nerves. At the front, the supratrochlea and supraorbital nerves supply the anterior scalp all the way up to the vertex. Along the anterolateral temporal region, the zygomatic otemporal nerve provides sensation. Just in front of the ear and across the temple, the area is supplied by the auriculotemporal nerve. Moving posteriorly, sensation behind the ear and the upper lateral occipital region comes from the lesser occipital nerve. Most of the posterior scalp up to the vertex is supplied by the greater occipital nerve, the dorsal ramus. The lowermost occipital region is covered by the third occipital nerve. Now let's look at lymphatic drainage of the scalp, another clinically important pattern. The anterior scalp and forehead drain into the submandibular lymph nodes. The lateral scalp, especially the region just in front of the ear, drains into the preauricular or parotid nodes. The posterolateral scalp drains into the mastoid nodes, and the posterior scalp drains into the occipital nodes. Ultimately, lymph from all these regions converges into the deep cervical lymph nodes.